Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks everyone for, for showing up both here in person as well as remote online. Um, you know, everything is uh, has been a little bit weird and we're sort of moving back onto into the, the, the way I guess the new normal will be. So we'll work through this. I think this is the, uh, it's been a while since I've given a talk, especially a talk in person. So I may be a little bit rusty here and, uh, you know, trying to remember how to people and all that stuff. So we'll go through this um, as, as we go through this, this talk. I generally, uh, I, I generally don't mind questions in, in like during uh, the, the talk. So that we, you know, if, if anyone has a question and wants to interrupt me, go right ahead. I think there's there's plenty of conversation to be had. Um, I think uh, this this talk may be a little bit uh, a little bit different in in terms of of, of how I've, I've sort of framed this 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 content. Uh, I think it, it goes towards um, you know what uh, what Mark had been saying is that you know robotics should be fun, and uh, on top of that, it should be uh, available for everyone. And that's really where where we go here in uh, in terms of my research as well as uh, um, okay yeah in in terms of sort of the research of my overall group now we we call ourselves lemur mostly because I really like primates and I tried to fit an acronym to the to the letters but uh, ultimately it's it's really this this question of ubiquity we want we want robots everywhere we want everyone to have access to robots and we need to solve a lot of technical problems to get to that point. So in our group, we do a lot of, of work on, 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 on algorithms, on mechanisms and materials, on human computer and human robot interaction, a whole bunch of stuff. But today I'm gonna sort of focus mostly on, on, uh, on one of these. Um, sorry, for some reason, oh, there we go. Yeah, the, 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 the last element, we're, we're like, for, for it, sort of for the contents of this talk, we're really focusing on this idea of, of computational design, computational manufacturing, with that specific goal of democratization. We wanna take these, these tools, and get it out into the world and get everyone to, to, to be able to use this. Now, before I get into the details, I, I do want to uh, say that all this other stuff, all the other work that I'm doing is uh, you, can, you can go to my website and uh, you know, take, a, take a look at all the work that, that we're doing in our lab. Uh, feel free to ask me questions about that in the panel. I, I hear we have a lot of time for questions about that. that. And I'll, I'll also, you know, speaking of that, point out that I'm just a person. I'm not really the one that, uh, that does anything interesting anymore. Um, all the all the good all the, all the really fun stuff has been done by by my students, and I'm just I'm just going to be talking about them and taking the, the credit. Um, and of course, you know, always have to thank the the people who who provide the money, uh, which is actually just funneled from people like you. So thank you, the taxpayers, to to make all this possible. So let's go back to to what um, what the real uh, core of this talk is going to be, and what really like my my main driver and my main motivation here is is this idea of of getting these robots to everyone. And I'm really highlighting this everyone uh, part of it. Which is sort of the, the main motivating factor, and, and this is where you know I'm going to take a, a, a detour and really spend a lot of time on this motivation. Um, and and uh, what I'll say is I'm not a economist, a economist. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not an anthropologist. I, I don't really know much about uh, sort of the science behind everything that I'm going to be talking about here, right here in the motivation. But I can see the results, and I you know I do. I, I like numbers. I like data. I like robots. I like putting this all into, into sort of the space that I can work at. I'll say that I'm gonna, when we start talking about the motivation here, I'll be talking about a lot of sociological and societal problems, which you know, I'm sort of viewing as, as a, an external observer. And you know, I'll, I'll put my take on it. I really encourage all of you to put your own take on, on this data and, and see where you can take this and, and how you can address this. So let's start with sort of one of the, the uh, you know, one, one of the, um, I guess, a, 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 a data point which, which indicates what's, what's I feel is, is a, a core challenge in society. And this is this income gap. The, uh, there, there's some portion of the population that has a lot of, uh, a lot of source of, of income and it, it's growing. And then there's a portion of the population that doesn't, and that's shrinking. And you, we can sort of take this, you know, income is sort of a snapshot. What is the, the, the rate of change of, of value? We can integrate that and talk about the, uh, we can talk about the, the wealth gap which is, you know, what is how that income in, uh, accumulates over time. And really it's this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this particular uh, quantity, which is the, like who has what. Um, and as time has been evolving over the past 10, 20 longer years, the haves continue to have more and the have nots continue to have less. And that, that gap, that separation is, is, is widening. Now, like, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate here again one more time and say that you know, this is a large societal problem. I don't claim to, to know all the details about this. I don't claim to know all the solutions for this. You know, I'll, I'll put my light, uh, my, I'll cast my sort of light on this as a roboticist and say, you know, here's something where I'm gonna talk about a bunch of correlations, not necessarily causations, not necessarily very, like obviously the, the solutions to all of them, but at least this is how I feel. 
And again, I, I hope you take away from this whatever you, you can and, and, uh, and look at that. So we have this problem of the, the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots. Now, why is this actually a problem? And so um, you know, here, here's uh, uh, another way of looking at this, the separation between that, the, the haves and the have-nots. And that's not only in terms of money and wealth and so on, but specifically technology. And there's many different ways of, of slicing technology, but ultimately, the, the, whatever way you look at it, it's pretty clear. You, know, you need resources, you need wealth, you need income, you need money to have technology. And that could be hardware, that could be services. Here we're talking about access to, to broadband and connectivity uh, through various uh, tools. And uh, you know, there, then we have this problem, which is that, you know, that, that the, without access to, to all this technology, it continues to, to result in, in larger separation gaps. And so here we can say, you know, at, over the last two years, we've had this, uh, you know, we've had COVID and, and that's been causing a lot of challenges. That's, uh, you, know, um, you know, like I said, this is my first in-person seminar in a, in a long time. Everything has been remote for the past few years. And you know, here, here's one slice of the data. And in this case, it's particularly separated by race. But really what I want to, uh, want to focus more on at this time is the correlation between the left and the right halves of these graphs, which is that when you have lower access to technology, and you have lower access to education as well. And you can see here that you know, over the past two years, especially this has been pretty clear, where when you have Zoom calls, and if you don't have, have reliable internet, you don't have reliable, uh, uh, um, you can't reliably hear what's being presented. And what you have is this, this gap in terms of uh, educational outcomes over the past two years. And you know, this is just a very clear data set, but it's over, over sort of the history of, of, uh, of our societies. Now, what happens when you have a gap in, in, engineer, in, sorry, in educational uh, outcomes? That, uh, that continues to grow. As this, this is sort of a, a graph of just what would happen with these, these, two, uh, the, these two years of, of reduced educational opportunities in sort of a generational approach. Like this, this will continue to have a negative impact on, on sort of humanity, on society, on the, the productivity of people over the, the coming years, years. and decades. Okay. Um, and so what we can see is that this is, it's not just a, a snapshot problem. It, this, this, this is a positive feedback loop. Um, we can take a look at that, that feedback, that, that sort of the, the, the generational impact in terms of what we often talk about the pipeline. There's, there's often, you know, this starts at one point and continues on. If, uh, you know, if, if there's reduced uh, economic productivity, if there's re reduced uh, um, resources available to one generation, that passes down to the next generation. And, you know, the lower, lower educational capabilities or lower educational opportunities at the higher, like at the, in the above generation, will pass itself, itself down. And really what, the, what this is showing is that, you know, that, that, that will percolate and that'll loop around. And what we end up with is this feedback loop, where when you have reduced access to education, when you have reduced educational opportunities, that translates into reduced economic opportunities. That means you have less, uh, less resources in your, in your family, in your community, in your, in your society, which then goes back into lower educational opportunities, and it continues all the way around. And there's this one point here, which is that access to technology, which is sort of the core driver behind a lot of what we do in, in, as educators in, in education and sort of in society as a whole. Now, you know, I wouldn't be tell, telling all this if there wasn't a solution or if I, I didn't feel there was a solution, but before we get into that, you know, before we get into the, the, the good stuff, I'll make it just a little bit worse, a little bit more, uh, more um, direct in that, you know, we, there, there's the adage of you can lead a horse to water. It's not just about access to technology, although there is some of that, the, uh, the, all the same factors that, that, uh, that cause for lower access to technology also cause for lower uh, engagement within the educational process. And this, there's, a, there's sort of a regular study done in California where, where I live right now, where they, they assess what's going on in terms of uh, participation in the educational process. And so there's the study of truancy of, of attendance at school. And there's a very, very strong correlation between the, ed, the, the economic status of the, the community and the, the attendance at school. And you, you know, it, it's, it's correlated to that. And, and one of the big challenges is it starts very early in that starting in kindergarten even, the, uh, the impacts of, of, uh, of societal uh, resources are felt in terms of, uh, of participation in the school process. And you can imagine if you don't go to kindergarten, how well prepared you may or may not be for first, second, third, fifth grade, 
all the way up to the rest of the educational process. And so once again, we're faced with this, uh, this, this positive feedback loop now in two directions. And this is where I finally start to say, there, it can be, there, there, there are things that we can do. Of course, there's certainly plenty of solutions throughout all of this. And I hope everyone finds multiple, many solutions to try to attack this from as many directions as we can. But what, uh, one of the things that I find particularly compelling is this idea of the endowment effect. That, uh, so this is, this is a, a broad effect that applies in many different avenues of, of, uh, of, of our lives. But ultimately, if you make something, you care. And that's where this, this, it sort of drives home where, where I'm trying to get to with this. But ultimately, it's this idea that the, uh, the participation in the creation process drives interest, drives engagement. And so now we can start to see where we can pull, pick away at these, these feedback loops. We want to make sure that you know, ultimately, it doesn't matter what's being made, but the, the, uh, trying to, to, to really focus on creation itself can uh, give us a, an avenue into breaking these loops. Now, you know, as, as Mark introduced me with, and as I sort of said in, in, in the abstract of this, robots are cool. So that's where we're going to get to. Like, I, I like robots. I think they're fun. That was one of the things that got me into engineering in the first place many years ago. It doesn't really matter what it is, but what we're going to do is we're going to say that we're going to take this loop and we're going to break it with this technology, this access to technology, in particular, creation of technology, so that we get more people involved in this process. We can give them the, the, the tools that they need and make them want to use the tools that they then have to, to build their, their educational opportunities, to then turn their, the, the, this, uh, this cycle around and really bring up the entirety of humanity, entirety of society. And so that's really the motivation. But before, uh, <clears throat> before we talk about just that, I'll say that you know, that's my motivation. Like I really care about this in particular. But there's more benefits to this than just that. It's not just about making sure that everybody improves with our, with our efforts that we're going to put into this engineering. And to talk about this, I'll bring up a slide from uh, one of my colleagues who, uh, who had published this in um, a, a paper in science about focused on sort of medical technology. But fundamentally, you know, across all of engineering, there's trade-offs. And what we're, we, we can look at is a trade-off between this, uh, you know, the, the one axis that I've been talking about, access, equity, fairness, whatever, we, however we want to phrase it, and a, another trade-off in terms of sort of what the canonical engineering performance metrics may be. This is sort of a hand-wavy graph. It's nothing quantitative, but there's always going to be some trade-off. And, you know, what, uh, what the, the argument there goes is that, you know, we, if we want to improve, we can go ahead and focus on either one of these axes. Let's, let's, let's focus on fairness, because for me, that's what I care about. Let's focus on, on accessibility, making sure everybody can benefit from our efforts. But as you do that, as you improve these things, you can see the, the trade-off curve, that Pareto front expands. You're improving across many different uh, performance metrics, even sort of the canonical metrics that we may think about when we think about engineering. And so to really highlight that fact, I'll start by pointing out this um, uh, the, the philosophy of Unix, which is, uh, you know, I, I run Linux, which caused some problems earlier today, but, um, you know, ultimately it starts from this one core principle that focus on one thing and do it well. Make a lot of little tools, a lot of little uh, solutions for the things that you're trying to solve. And we can bring this now into the robotics world with some, uh, with some uh, examples, some videos from, uh, from the DARPA Robotics Challenge a, a few years back. And of course, these are cherry picked examples. There were lots of really good. Uh, success stories, but man, there's a lot of failure stories as well, which is fine. Failure is good. It causes us to learn more, but you can see that these are really, uh, we're, th these are tools that are very anti that Unix philosophy. It's one robot, a single device that tries to accomplish everything. And that makes it challenging. Trying to, to get one of these things to, to do anything individual is, will, will be a lot harder. Now, you know, the, this, this does translate into the, the, what, we, what we've been talking about, this idea of accessibility. Each one of these robots costs millions of dollars, like in the, in the million dollar range. That's a lot of investment to, to work on, on some of these things. It, you know, this is certainly something that, that causes, uh, you know, causes some amount of barrier to, 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 to creation with, with, with these tools. But even more than that, it, uh, it causes some, some impediment to experimentation. It causes some, uh, some, uh, some barriers to innovation. And going back to the, uh, the, the Unix philosophy, we look at this, this, this third point, which is this idea of iteration, 
try things, break things, do things again, kill, like, throw out any, anything that doesn't work and focus on the things that do. Trying to, trying to sort of uh, apply this philosophy to a million dollar robot, all of a sudden you can see where, where, where we may start finding some, uh, some inhibitions, not even in terms of uh, you know, who can access it, but if you have this robot, like how likely are you to try something very drastic, something uh, highly innovative that may cause potentially uh, breaking failures? And so that's really where, where this all comes together into, into sort of the core motivation for what I'm, what I'm trying to present, what I'm trying to work on, not just in, in this presentation, but sort of overall in my life and in, in my, uh, in my uh, research lab uh, up till uh, going forward, is this idea of, of, of lowering the access to, to, to creation and um, making sure that that creation is, is allowed, like you can, you can innovate, you can innovate rapidly. You can sort of go through this process, design, test, build, and, and repeat and create with, uh, with low cost for more people to be able to do it, for more people to be able to do it with less uh, inhibitions whenever they do so. And so I've set a target. I've set this target of $1 and we're working towards that. It's certainly not something that is, uh, that is um, immediately uh, achievable right now. It's, it's a, a bigger picture goal. When we say $1, that's sort of a, a, you know, a hypothetical target. And what we can do within that dollar is less important than that we can do something within that dollar. And so uh, with that, I'll, I'd like to get into what we can do, what we have done within this dollar, and really like how do we get to, uh, get, how do we bring the costs down? And this comes from the, uh, from the work that I had been starting and, and working on for a while, this idea of printable uh, designs. When we say printable, we really, you know, printable can mean many different things to many different people. I, I focus on printable as this idea of, uh, of making with, excess, with, with currently available materials, not requiring a separate manufacturing installation to, uh, to, to, to do, to create, but rather create in home, in, in sort of where your, what your current uh, situation is. And so these are videos from my postdoc, uh, from, from when I was doing my, my work early on. This was the, 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 the previous nature of printable robots. These were things that were built out of, out of uh, paper and, and, and plastic cut up with scissors and, and sort of conventional tools. And they can, you know, you can walk and drive and, and move. Uh, sorry for the low resolution, uh, but it's like a, a manipulator arm that's moving around. That was great. Back then we had these, uh, these printable robots. We, 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 what we focused on for printable was building it out of paper. So it's similar to origami, although we're allowing cutting. And you get these designs um, that, that you can do a lot of fun stuff. That was, that was several years ago. Uh, when we talk about the printable part, we're talking about that mechanical body, the, the, the mechanical structures uh, that, that, that form this, uh, this design. And, um, and you know, that, that's sort of in contrast to the, the previous history of manufacturing, which required sort of machine shops because you're working with, with metal and wood and plastic and so on. But in order to make a robot, it's not just that structural body. There's more to it than that. There's the controls, the, the intelligence that's driving the entire system that pulls information from the sensors that, that queries the environment, drives in, sends information to the actuators to influence the environment. All of these things are things that we want to get to, to, to also, we, that we need to also include in this, uh, in this system. And I'll, I'll say that there's also uh, some power involved, some, some battery that, uh, that we may need to, to think about. For this talk, uh, I'll, we'll leave that out. Power is always going to come in from off board. There's, there is other work that's working on printable batteries on, on trying to make some more accessible power supplies, we're not going to focus on that here. We're really going to talk about this other half of the robotic system, which is the electronics, the electromechanical interface. And how can we take that, which currently you would, which uh, up until now you'd have to buy. You'd have to buy a microcontroller, some sensors. And how can we make these also printable in that they're also manufacturable, they're also creatable at home with, with uh, low cost materials. Ultimately, what we're saying is we have the, we originally had these, these printable robots that we had called printable, but they're really only partially printable. You take these sheets of, of material like paper or, or thin film plastic and, and turn them into the body. We want to apply that same approach to the, uh, to the actuators and sensors using, again, low cost material to make fully printable robots. And the material uh, that we're, we're talking about that we'll use a lot of in here is conductive sewing thread. So it's just nylon thread that's coated with some, some silver paint that, that makes it conductive, rapid, like easily available uh, uh, in many places, very cheap. Um, and driven sort of by the hobbyist industry, just like all the, the stuff that, that, that we do here in, in my group. Um, and we're going to take this and turn this into the fully printable robots. 
and I'll just go ahead and, and get to the punchline, which is the, this design, this device that we, we, we started with, which is this oscillator. And we, 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 we had the, the body, the structure of this, which is origami inspired. We cut it out of a sheet of, of thin film material. It could be paper, it could be plastic, really whatever it, it, uh, you want to use. We focus on, uh, on plastic just because it's about as cheap, and, but it has some, some, uh, some different properties that we find compelling. And I'll show you one of the demos in a bit. And we couple that with these, uh, with these uh, nylon uh, sewing threads, which uh, we, haven't, we, we didn't develop the, uh, the approach to spinning them up. But if you spin them up and coil them really tightly, you make these really nice like muscle style actuators. And what we did is we figured out a way of combining all this into this, this neat design, which causes, which generates some, some controlled behavior, some non-trivial, uh, we can call, start to say that it's sort of in the direction of intelligent behavior. Um, now, when we put all this together, this particular device is far less than a dollar. It's, I think that all the raw materials put together is about 40 cents. And it's not that you know, it requires uh, a whole lot of investment. It does take some time. It's not something that you, you, know, you give 40 cents and you have it. You still have to put it together. But it's a, it's a couple hours. Now, a couple hours, uh, maybe, maybe a full day when you're just getting started and you're doing this for the first time. As you get some more practice, you'll get to this. But ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you the opportunity, you and everybody, the opportunity to, to, to play around with this stuff. Now, what, uh, what happens, this is sort of a video of it operating. You're, what's, what's coming in from off board is the power. It's just a constant power supply. So it could be driven by a battery or a solar cell or one of these, uh, any other source. This is a benchtop uh, power supply. And what it does is it, it, uh, when you send in constant power, it oscillates back and forth. It's a mechanical oscillator that, that sort of clicks left and right. And this can be the core of a lot of intelligent behaviors. Now, you know, we can say that this, this, is, uh, this is something that will go into that, that, the block of the robot that makes it do something that, is, that, that separates robots from other kinds of creations. So just a quick uh, rundown of, its, um, of, of, of how it works. We, when you feed in constant uh, power, it, it, um, when, the, when the robot is in one state, you can see the, there's uh, one of these two actuators. There's two actuators, one on each side. One of them is in tension. As you feed current through it, it, uh, it, uh, it heats up. It generates some force, which pulls the, uh, which pulls the, the entire system to, to, like, uh, to one side. It makes use of a bistable beam in the center, which clicks over. It snaps through the, the bistable instability. And now it, draw, it puts tension on the other uh, actuator, which now has its current going through it, which gives it also some force on the other direction. And it flips back to, to snap back the other direction. You get this oscillating behavior from constant power. Now, that's all well and good. That's a, a, a device. It's a single mechanism that, that sort of pulls us all together. You can now take this and turn it into what we had hoped for initially, which is this printable robot. And this is going to be the, the first one I'll show. Is, is a, it, it's, a, it's sort of a boat that paddles itself. And this is really one of the, the highlights of, uh, of why we're doing this. Uh, um, it's sort of the, the point that I, I started with saying that you start with accessibility, and you'll develop, you'll discover all these other performance uh, issues, these other values to conventional, uh, to, to the, uh, sort of conventional metrics of, of, of uh, engineering. We're, we, we focused on printability, and so that's why we built this out of paper. Now, uh, when you build it out of paper, you get a lot of other benefits from it. The fact that you have uh, compliance built into the mechanism, you can do these kinds of designs where you couple uh, linear forces to, uh, to rotational forces uh, using these, these compliant mechanisms and, and hinges that are sort of inherently within the system. This is all built out of origami-inspired designs, which gives the ability to, uh, to take uh, the linear motion of the actuator and translate it through this, this pivoting system, this, this uh, flexible pivoting system to get a paddling motion. And as the, the, the thing moves back and forth through the, the snapping motion, the paddle itself rotates uh, up and down. And what we end up with is the, the swimmer that, uh, oops, sorry. Preview, there's, a, there's another robot in place. There you go. And so what we end up with a swimmer that the paddle like moves up and down. And as it, all, all that's coming in is constant power, but you get this, this controlled behavior that it allows it to sort of swim across a, a surface. We, you know, we, we added some other stabilizing pins and all that. It's origami. You can just go ahead and play around with that. And now with this device, which similarly costs uh, you know, less than a dollar, 50 cents, and uh, you know, that's not including the power supply, sending in constant power, you can go around and now do some interesting designs on this robotic system.
It doesn't need to be just water-based uh, robots. So we can take this, the same structure, the same idea. And instead of having fins and, and, uh, and stabilizers, we can put little asymmetric legs. They have, uh, you know, because of the different friction caused by the bent legs, again, with using some elements of the flexibility, the curvature of the system, putting some extra weight on the, uh, the uh, snap-through oscillator, we're making this little scratch drive actuator, uh, like a bristle bot, if you would. And it, it, you know, as the, the weight snaps back and forth, you have little jerks of force that cause it to step forward as, it, as, it, uh, as the oscillator oscillates. Now, this one, we'll, we'll say, maybe not quite fully printable, just to, to give it a little bit more weight instead of using paper for the, uh, uh, for on, the, on, the, um, on the oscillation, uh, on the oscillating beam, we put a little bit of, uh, of mass. It could be silly putty, or it could be little uh, you know, beads, or whatever you want. Just give it some more mass to get, get it a little bit more uh, speed, some more force. You get now robots that can walk. And once again, um, you know, thinking about uh, how this, uh, sorry, uh, um, so now we have this, this oscillator and it can move back and forth. We can, make, we can make things swim, we can make things walk. It doesn't need to be a, a fully mechanical system. We have a, a beam that's moving back and forth. We can put little switches on that beam, electrical switches that we can then uh, uh, connect to electrical circuits. And we can say, let's, you know, for, for the sake of uh, amusement, just because this is fun, We'll put it on little LEDs that we can again cut and, and, and mount into, into a piece of paper and get some, some interesting display. And this is sort of an animated dancing stick figure where it's it's driven. Now, you know, there the actual performance of this is driven by this, this uh this mechanical uh, electromechanical oscillator. Here you'll start to see a little bit of, of, of controllability that we have over this as well. When we start uh we, we can sort of change the speed of the animation by changing the current flow into the system. And there's many other uh, forms of control that we can get to on this, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and we can sort of start taking this approach and extending it even further, not just being a switch, but it can be a controllable switch. A controllable switch starts looking like a gate, and we can have a logic gate, and this is uh, sort of a, the, the simple logic gate, which is an inverter. We make take use of the same uh, fundamental behavior, and we can turn it into a particular uh, logic system. We have, uh, an, uh, you know, the, we can use knots, we can make ands and ors, and as a result, we can sort of compile them up. Now we're talking about real, like moving really into the realm of intelligence, into the realm of computation, not just functionality like uh, sequencing and oscillation, but logic and, and intelligence and so on. And, um, you know, with this, it, the, we, we also have all these, these capabilities that started with the um, with the uh, uh, approach towards accessibility, but there's there's more to it than that, and this is this goes back into the functionality. Now, the conventional functionality of, of when we talk about robots, we can also talk about the, these these systems that are oh, sorry about the that these systems that are you know robotic systems. A conventional uh, challenge to all these, no matter how they're manufactured, is where can you run these systems? Where can you run uh, the, the the designs that you've created? These things are built out of paper, in this case, you know, thin film plastic with sewing thread. There's no, there's no metal, there's no silicon involved in this. There's, no, uh, you know, there's nothing that, that would be degraded by uh, operating underwater or in strong magnetic fields. Uh, this thing on the, on the, on the side is, is a, a, under a really strong electromagnet, something where you may start to say, well, how do we get these systems operating in MRI or NMR machines? Or, or how can you do this like in under like geothermal vents where the, the, the starting the approach towards accessibility has gotten this ability to iterate and design and create in a way that generates value for, for no matter how you slice it. So that's, uh, you know, th th these are some, some of the designs that we've made, some of the, the performance that we've built. And, you know, there's, there's certainly plenty more that can be done with this. And I, I, I you know, I would love to, to work with you all to, to take some of these and, and build new ideas, build new designs, build new capabilities into this approach. But ultimately, um, you know, up till now, all of these designs have been created by my research group, by my uh, um, by my my engineering students, and ultimately, this has sort of been one of the challenges of printable robots, which is that when you design these systems, especially when we're talking about trying to design for these accessible processes uh, using scissors and paper, it requires some amount of expertise, some amount of understanding to be able to make sure that you get the right functionality out of it. You'll need to do some kind of modeling and 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 analysis. And uh, you know the, the tools that, that exist to do this kind of analysis require some amount of expertise. If you're doing finite element analysis, I mean, it, it takes 
it, it takes just a, like years, uh, or at least uh, in my case, years of, of education to figure out just how to turn the thing on, how to, how to talk to the, the, to the program itself. You can build lower order models and, and try to do some kind of simple, simpler kinematics so you don't have to get into, to, into, the, uh, into sort of the, the finite element, the mechanical systems, but they're inaccurate. They're, they're necessarily simplifications. And once again, you need, you need to have some amount of, of engineering expertise, some background, in order to figure out how does that translate into particular uh, behaviors that you're looking for. And so the challenge that we have is trying to take not only the, the, the mechanisms and the, the, the designs that can now be accessibly manufactured, but take the design part of it, the, the creation also, and make that uh, available to more people. And so this is where I, I uh, um, where I, uh, you know, we go back to this, this core design and I'm gonna do the thing that all engineering talks have to do, which is make you realize how amazingly brilliant I am by going through all of the various interesting mathematical equations. We can talk about like, you know, getting a bunch of, of, of system equations, doing some, some finite element analysis on this thing, using some, some math and some physics and, and putting that all in through some, some uh, you know, some approximations using fancy words like order of magnitude and all that. And after a lot of effort, we can go through and say, boom, we've solved all those problems. We have this nice equation that, that, that captures relationships between design and behaviors. And okay, fine. Maybe that's not quite so understandable for us, but the nice thing about it now is that this is very understandable for computers. And so we can take all of the, the engineering effort that we did put it into, into understanding these mechanisms and these systems and putting it, put it into an optimization problem. We can go ahead and, and define some kind, of, uh, some, some kind of cost functions on these behaviors. And ultimately what we can say is we can write a program, write a computational tool that abstracts all of that away and to, uh, presents to the user a single, uh, a sort of a simple um, computational design question, which is, sorry about the, uh, the clicks. Um, where you where you know you take this and you you say that the the objective you the, as a as a as an uh, as a uh, as a designer you have some objectives you want to get some performance in this case going back to this this oscillator maybe the performance is you want this to oscillate with a period of four seconds you know that's the flap that you you want to do or the step size that you want to take and ultimately you know however you get there you want to get there now we can say let's let's get a little bit more uh, understanding from the user. In this case, the user may be somebody who's trying to cut this thing out of paper with some scissors. Manufacturing is not going to be very reliable. And so we have some optimization criteria, which says, let's make this robust to manufacturing errors. And ultimately, the, the, the system itself will tell you, will do that design, give you an actual layout that says, you know, here's all the, the, the design parameters. Here's the geometry. Here's the, the, the current and the voltage that you'll need to connect to this. Maybe that becomes an input instead. I only have this battery. How do I drive this thing? Put that all through. And you get your your design. Doesn't need an engineer in the loop anymore. We've we've taken all of our engineering uh, uh, our engineering knowledge and wrapped it up into this computational program. And you can see, sort of, this is a, a comparison between uh, the um, between the uh, generated the computationally generated system, the computationally generated design, and possibly one that was created by a uh, an expert. You know the, the bottom uh, the bottom set of data is, is one that we had started with, and that's where really where we came. Again, the, this idea of making things accessible, making things easier, has generated improved value. The, the 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 computational approach has generated higher robustness. If you were a little bit sloppy in your cutting and you you varied your 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 geometric parameters by some amount, we can still say within ten percent of of the desired performance. Whereas if you had sort of tried to do this manual and said, all right, well here's a very nice uh, set of parameters. If you had access to, to high performance laser cutters and, and various other manufacturing tools, great, you could get it. But when you don't, you have this, this variability. So we can sort of improve all this and you know, the, the, all the, the approach that we took, the, the sort of the math and physics that went into this turns into something that's, that's really quick. It's, it's a, an optimization problem that can be solved by computers, by the, the technology that hopefully will translate into uh, a greater amount of, of accessibility of design. We can take a look at this uh, not only in terms of the forward pass, trying to come up with the design, but we can take a, take a look at this in some sort of feedback where we try to improve designs, enhance the, the capabilities of a, a designer. And so this is, this is an example where we had a, 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 an actual problem that showed up in one of our other research projects. We had a blimp and it was trying to perch. It was trying to land and, 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 and hang on to a beam. And you know, when, when uh, in sort of windy conditions, 
we, you know, we, it, the, the wind would cause the, 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 the grip to fail and the, the balloon would just fly off of the perch. So we can take our, our, our computational evaluation pipeline, say, do some, of the, some analysis of the, the system, identify the weak points of the, uh, of the structure. This being a folded structure, it's the, you know, there's, there's not enough stiffness in these beams. We can go through and, and look at all of our, our approaches to, to these printable manufacturing and find a better design, a stiffer design and go ahead and use that and put that on our, our gripper instead. And ultimately, as the, the wind blows, you know, the, 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 the balloon bobbles around, but it, it doesn't fall off. Now, we need some kind of computational process in here because there is this trade-off. Either, you know, if, if, we, if we have this system be too weak, as we saw initially, it'll, it'll fly off. The whole reason we're using the, these, uh, the printable process on these blimps is because making things out of paper, making things out of thin film plastics is a lot lighter than trying to machine things out of, out of metal or, or wood or trying to even 3D print some, some, uh, some stuff. And if we didn't optimize these designs, it'd be too heavy and then the blimp wouldn't fly. And so, you know, again, this, this whole idea of, of taking our engineering expertise, wrapping it up into computational tools to do the design and then translate it into fabricatable parts gives us new benefits, new, uh, new functionality. And so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, in the interest of sort of having more opportunity for conversation, I'll, I'll blow through a, a lot of the other research that we're doing, but it's the same idea of the pipeline, where you start with some, some engineering objectives, some requirements, and you say that what, what about this is preventing the, the adoption of this technology? What resource is the high, most highly contested? How can we re reduce the re resource requirements? How do we find some way of minimizing these resource requirements? using some amount of computational optimization. We have to figure out how to take the, uh, take the uh, framing of a research problem and recast it, recast it as a way of, of minimizing the resource rather than maximizing performance. And when we do that, we come up with new models. We come up with new computational models that are, you know, that are driven through mathematics and driven through physics, all wrapped up into, into, into algorithms. And when we implement that, we can go through and iterate. And we can, we can use our tools, use our, our process to come up with more accessible solutions, which also translate to more performant solutions. And we can do this on, on you know, the sensing and perception pipeline, where we, where we talk about uh, localization and mapping, as well as sort of consensus and other algorithms across uh, sort of more general um, you know, uh, input uh, front ends uh, for, or back ends for, for sensing. We can take a look at that, the same pipeline for control and, uh, and the other elements of sort of the intelligence behind, uh, behind these, uh, these systems. And, and you know, one of the things to, to note is when we talk about minimizing resources, sometimes they are very engineering driven resources like bandwidth or, or uh, RF hardware, things maybe like uh, cost of, of, the, of the, the, the the electronics or the, the, um, the, the capabilities of the, the, the sensors. But we can also talk about resources in terms of understanding, in terms of uh, you know, the expertise of the system, of, of the users that are, in, in, uh, that are part of this problem. We can say, if we wanted to try to minimize that, again, how do we make use of computational tools to minimize the resource, which is engineering background necessary to make use of these things, not just design them? And we can get, again, some, some neat solutions for that as well. And so ultimately this, this sort of comes together into that, that core problem that we started with, which is that we're looking at the entire pipeline of robotics because robots are cool and, and I find them cool. I want everyone else to have, have the same experiences that I have. And that takes, that takes uh, some amount of solutions all through the, the, robotics, uh, the, the robotics subsystems, sensing and control and, and planning and, and all the way through to, to design and manufacturing and then operation and then interactions with humans. Ultimately, we wanna take all of that entire process and get it down into an accessible factor. Now, when we say accessible, I really wanted to emphasize that this is not just accessible to the undergrad uh, engineering community at UCLA or at UPenn. You know, we all have access to these amazing facilities as uh, you know, I'll, I'll take some more tours later on today of seeing all the, the really cool things that you have, but let's use the things that we do have to make it uh, to make it available to those who don't even have that, to, to people who may not be at a university, to people who may be in a kindergarten somewhere where the, the, you know, all they have access to is construction paper and colored pencils. What can we do then to take our abilities and our privilege into the world of places where they don't have that? 
and still make it so that that loop, that feedback loop that results in the further separation can be closed, can be broken, that we can, build, uh, we can sort of advance all of humanity simultaneously up towards the places that we want to go. So with that, I think that I think that that's a great way to launch into this discussion. I gave my thoughts on this matter. I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear, you know, what what did what did this uh, inspire in you? How do you feel that uh, engineering and technology and and everything that we're we're putting our efforts into can lead to these particular kinds of outcomes? Okay, thank you. I think. Uh... Yeah, thank you so much for that inspiring talk. I think you gave a lot of great examples that, yeah, I'm very excited to see. And I'm wondering, um, I'll ask my own question while I wait for people to put in the chat. Uh, so you showed a bunch of different like simple systems that you're able to like use this computational optimization to allow um, a very inexpensive enhancement and optimization. But I'm wondering how you might think about combining these simple units into a larger system and how can we standardize an approach so that we can collaborate and make this accessible to the general public? Great, thanks. I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a great question which sort of leads, which, which has driven a lot of the, the exploration that I've done here, this idea of composability, right? We, you know, it's not enough that we find one solution to one subsystem that solves one problem because ultimately our problems are interconnected, are integrated. That's what makes robotics robotics is that it couples together a lot of these uh, these sort of challenging problems. And so, you know, there's two parts to that question. One is, you know, we whenever we do our design, whenever we do our designs, whenever we do our engineering, we definitely look towards a view of composition. And so we have, uh, you know, we have a, a, a tool that we, we that we've developed that we're using to, to think about pull, like pulling these together. We want to make sure that, um, you know, whenever we do anything, we abstract it in a particular way that captures not only the functionality, but also the manufacturing process that went into that functionality in such a way that we can couple them. This is again, one of the, the benefits of doing things in a printable way. If you have paper, paper is really easy to compose. You just put print one on one side, you print one on the next side, make sure that the two lines line up and now you have both of them together. Now that may be, uh, you know, either, there needs to be some computational geometry that goes into there to make sure you don't overlap and you don't, you know, you don't uh, exceed bounds or whatever. But so there's, there's this idea that as long as we're making everything, we are going to make sure that they they fit within the same paradigm, the same sort of manufacturing and design paradigm that we can we can take many of these and sort of tile them together, put them together in, in ways that that allow them to compose. There's the broader question, which is, you know, how do my solutions compose with your solutions and with everyone else's solutions? And this is the question of standardization. And I think that's a much broader question. And I don't really have a great answer for that. The way I'm approaching that is that. I make all of my tools and all of my, or, or you know, all the solutions that we come across, open source. Not just you know, publish the paper and, and call it a day, but make sure that the code is available on uh, on GitHub and, and you know, in, in the various Git repositories, so that hopefully, as other people start doing their work in this space, they take our tools. They, they you know, that we give them a leg up, like that. That says, all right, you don't you don't need to solve a lot of these problems that we already did. But now, when you build those solutions, they're already integrated within this environment. And now, sort of the the, the standardization comes hopefully in, you know, sort of intrinsically through the uh, research and design process. It's still a work in progress. We want to make sure that, that we have all of our work that's sort of solid enough that when somebody else starts using it, they can immediately go on it and work on their thing. And hopefully they'll come out of that. If not, maybe a different standard will come out. I'm not necessarily saying that ours is the best. Ours is the, the one that everyone needs to converge to. As long as we do all converge, as long as everyone still has in their minds that we do want this interoperability. We want everybody to participate in the same process. Then, then I'll call it a success. You know, I think it's this idea of, of making sure everyone is aligned in their objectives and, and views, and and then sort of getting this this entire system, uh, you know, to to like a community around it to to go off and, and work further. So sorry, I'm not used to the microphone. Um, so my question was, if you were to forward 10, 20 years, you know, what's your ideas on where you see this going? I mean, there's limitations and there's advantages. You know, what route would you see potentially this going if we were to just look into the future and, 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 and see what this could, could do? Great. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm, I'm going, uh, you know, where, where is this going in the next couple of years? 
I'll, I'll, I'll frame it in a way that lets me, let, lets me continue to stay on my soapbox and give the answer that I, that I want to give is ultimately what I, where, where I see this going and where, where, where sort of my direction is, is that in maybe not in 10 years, maybe in 20 years from now, robotics is not going to be driven by roboticists. It's not going to be us here talking about this. This, this conversation that we're having is going to be happening in a, you know, in a, in a, in a town hall somewhere, in a, in a classroom in some kindergarten, and, you know, in, in the field somewhere, right? The idea is that, you know, where, where I want to go with this is, you know, why I'm doing this with paper is that, you know, the, the, the next round of iteration, maybe instead of happening at, in, at a graduate student seminar, will be an undergraduate seminar. I'm, you know, we're already building this into my undergraduate curriculum, into the, the design capstones that we're working on. All right, then, you know, and within five years, this is going into the high schools and middle schools of, 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 of our neighborhoods. And so ultimately, it's, it's taking this, this work that we're doing uh, and, and pushing it down the, down the pipeline. And what does it need to get there? The, 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 we need to have some more, um, so, uh, as, as the question that from before, we need some more interoperability. We want some more, more ways of making sure that the, 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 the materials that are being uh, explored are, are, are things that everyone else is looking at simultaneously. Um, we want to, we want to actually get these, these tools more usable. And you know, I think one of the, the, the big challenges is, is, you know, I, I, I sort of glossed over this in saying that there's computational optimization that's thrown into this. Well, computational optimization still needs a computer. And as, you know, as I started with computers are not necessarily that ubiquitous if you sort of look at the broad path. And so, you know, bringing computational requirements down trying to make the interface of those computational requirements easier. The research over the next five or 10, 20 years is going to be towards you know, making it more, you know, trying to, again, figure out what those barriers are. We start with the, some, with the, the barriers of, of mechanics, of materials, of design knowledge. As we start breaking them apart, we'll find more. And we'll, we'll try to figure out what is it that's, that's stopping this. As, as we get to more and more communities, we'll find more and more of these things. That's where our engineering expertise will come into play to figure out how do we how do we bypass that? A couple somewhat similar questions in the chat as they're along those lines, um, asking about. Um, well, one question is: Have you sought and gotten feedback from the those who for whom your work is designed since you're talking about involving young students? So you're saying like in the next few years, maybe that's when you're doing that. But we're wondering if you've started that process. Right. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a great question. Like, you know, we, I, I talk about this from from you know sitting in my chair in the ivory tower. You know, there's only so much that I can do. I need to get access to to the people who I'm trying to reach. So we have we have summer programs that bring in high school students. We have uh, you know, like I, I said, we I'm doing this through with through our, my undergraduate uh, approaches as well. You know, we we have plenty of undergrads that come through, moving to the high school students again. You know, there is there is certainly a challenge in in accessing the the high school students. That may may need the most attention to this. Um, you know, th this is something that that we we are trying to work on. We're there, we're, we're sort of moving in that space. Um, you know, there there's always more that can be done. I think we're you know it's something that as we build out more of the technology, we'll start ramping that up as well. But for now, you know, trying to get like all the the high school students who can come by, like the ones maybe they're they're near near us in geographically or have connections through their 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 families or their their friends. To come in and, and actually work with it. So we've we've had some uh, some 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 rounds of summer programs where we bring in where where we bring in high schools and they build a thing. They build a robot, not specifically with this. This the 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 oscillator itself has been uh, has is sort of just the very the newest stuff that that I'm I'm talking to you all about. But the earlier printable robots where we do give them you know a microcontroller board and some some servos and say fold it all up and build build some stuff, um, and then and they do something interesting with that. So yeah, so we 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 worked with high school students. Um, we did a, a one problem, one project once with middle school students. Haven't really brought it all the way down to uh, elementary school students, and really haven't uh, gone much outside the uh, the you know the uh, the U.S. environment. But I would love to. I'd love to to try more of, of that and, and see how we can, you know, how we can go and find what the the barriers are to to other people that that I have even less uh, access to. Uh, there's another question. So you have models to optimize tangible things like material use and forces, which is exciting. But what about a model for the teachability or learning potential of design? Are you interested in autonomously generating lesson plans as part of your pipeline? Or is there a different socioeconomic impact you might be able to model and generate? I think that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, I, I'll, I'll say that you know, I, I spent a very small amount of time thinking about the, uh, the, you know, the computational design of lesson plans. I think that's 
you know, I would love to see more research in that. You know, I think that that there is certainly something to be said for, you know, the uh, the, you know, the technology underlying it is only as useful as it is how you communicate that to the to the audience. There, we we've built curricula around this. They've all been manually driven. They, like you know, I, I I've I, I've experienced teaching undergrads, and so I created a, a curriculum around that. Some of my undergrads have, or some of my graduate students have experienced teaching high school students, so they built specific cur uh, curriculum around how do we incorporate this into that. Um, I think there, this, this sort of goes into a, a broader question of what does computational automation mean? And you know, I think there's, uh, at least in, in my view of it, I think there's, there's a lot more value to having computational automation be included in the human design loop, that, there are, you know, that it's not fully automated and you push a button and then you get out what you want. There's somebody involved. We have many, many years, centuries of experience in how to teach. Now I say we, not me personally, but you know the the, academic, the education community. There's schools of education. There's like plenty of, of knowledge encoded in the humans. Let's get them involved in the process. And so rather than have a push button lesson generator, we have a teacher come in and say, you know, this is uh, you know this is how I'm approaching my my uh, my curriculum right now, and a tool can help uh, adjust that and say. Here's something you may want to, to include in this with our tool. And, uh, and then they, you know, the teacher can go back and say, well, it doesn't quite work in this way. And the automation tool can go ahead and say, oh, well, how about this other thing? And this, this kind of like interaction, I think, is sort of the, the, uh, a very, uh, I think, you know, on one hand, it's a sort of a, uh, an increment, a way to incrementally progress towards this computational uh, design. On the other hand, I think it's sort of a very valuable way to, to make sure that we get the best of all of the knowledge that comes out of this. But I think you know, fundamentally, this, this idea of translating curriculum development, especially when it comes to technology, into a computational problem is, is amazing. I would love to see more, uh, more interactions and more, more conversations around that as well. There's a, a question back here. Oh, thank you. Um, so when you, um, yeah, so you have talked about how you can reduce the price of the materials uh, and also a standardized process of, you know, designing something uh, like according to requirement. So I have a question about the softwares. So you mentioned that you use like MATLAB to optimize for the design, but these softwares, including some CAD softwares are insanely expensive to license. So like, are you aiming to develop your own software or do you think we should do like this in some other ways? That, that's a great question. I, 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 I have to say, I did foresee that a little bit when I, when I noted that the, the optimization, we did it in using FMinCon and MATLAB. Um, ultimately, we, you know, the, the reason that, I guess, what we do here in, in our lab here, when we do, what we do in our lab, we'll make use of the tools that we have access to, but we're not going to stop there. Uh, now, that it, now that we know that it's solvable using an optimization solver, let's get that solution into the tools that are accessible that are free and open source. So there are optimization solvers that, that run in Python that don't require any, uh, any uh, upfront cost to, 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 to make use of. Um, you know, in, in this case, the engineers that work on this are far more comfortable working in MATLAB. They do all that to make sure it works, know what the, the pipeline is. And then there is the, the next step, which we don't stop at MATLAB. Everything then goes into, and I'll say Python because that's what we do a lot of, but ultimately, you know, the, the FOSS community is, is super broad. There are many tools out there that have, that have made use of all the same sort of things. You know, again, going back to the, the first question, which I think was a great first question, standardizing, standardizing interfaces, not just to, to mechanical systems and to, to the, these build systems, standardizing interfaces to computation. That's what the, the FOSS community has, has resulted in, has come to. And we'll do that. We'll, we'll become a part of it. Sometimes we may find problems that, that need us to write our custom tools that don't, don't have the existing solutions out there. Yeah, we'll do that. We will absolutely go ahead and build these tools and make sure that they stay within that same ecosystem. They, they hook into all the other solutions. They, uh, they, they are free and open source and, and sort of e and available to everyone. You, you're absolutely right. Like it's not just a matter of the, the, the stuff, the hardware bits. It's also a matter of, of sort of the, the, knowledge, the, the, the computational bits. And you know, the, the knowledge of course comes out in, in research papers that we put on our website and make sure that everyone can access that as well not just having to have access to, you know, the whatever the Elsevier library costs for anything like that. Um, hey, so I, um, I really enjoyed the, the talk and, and the whole uh, uh, high level aspect of things. And I have kind of actually I have two questions. But the first uh, high level question is, 
um, on the idea of you know breaking the cycle uh, of um, uh, the economics, all that stuff you said in the beginning. Uh, the, the it was very compelling the having a maker space and making, um, and and so I've written proposals. I almost I've been thinking about writing a proposal along these lines for making maker spaces for uh, low resource communities and that type of thing. But the the thing that was new to me was um, the the arguments that you made there about making can change people are there studies are, so part of the thing that i think could help this whole effort is if there is a way that you can make it more uh when when people are writing proposals can make it more convincing like there are studies that show x and y and, uh, of, of the impact of, of making and breaking that cycle are there things like that yeah so um I, you know there, there's, there's actually two parts to that question i think um there's you know th so the question is i guess fundamentally you know, I started with with all of my motivation, which is which is great in a high level. But you know, if you want to if you want to get resources from somebody, you need to you need to be more clear that this correlation is not just a, a correlation, but there's a clear causation that can be supported. Um, there are studies that are done. Uh, so I mean, the fact that it even has a name, the endowment effect, the idea that creation generates quantitative value, that has been extensively studied. There's there's quantitative reports about that, as it specifically applies to maker spaces. I'm not, I, I don't know, there are studies that have done that. Uh, you know, I think the slide that I had at the beginning had, uh, had a few links in there. Um, there, there, are, there are studies that do that. I don't know to what extent how quantitative they are. Ultimately, the, the studies, are like the, the, the deeply quantitative studies on, you know, how much added value the, the personal creation has on that, again, lives in the theory world. They're like economists that, 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 that have generated some, some analysis there. There's sort of a broad spectrum in terms of how applicable it is um, you know, how, how easy it is to, to quantify versus how realistic those, those models are. Um, so I'll say that there's, uh, there's some, uh, you know, th I think that the, the amount of support varies with sort of how, 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 how precise you wanted to make that statement. But I think there, there, are, there, are, there are certainly uh, plenty of, of ways of exploring that, not just within the context of maker spaces, but sort of in, in sort of the broader context of, you know, why does it, you know, why, why do these things like the, uh, the, the painting nights, uh, you know, at, at your local bar, why do they exist, right? Like it, it gives, the, there's, there's these approaches to, to creation that say, well, yeah, the painting that you end up with is going to be pretty terrible. Well, I, I, that I will end up is going to be pretty terrible. I don't, I don't say anything about it there, but you're going to, you know, you, you made it, right? And I think, you know, you can even just take a look at in elementary school, like what is, what does the curriculum look like in elementary school? Like, yeah, you, you, you learn some reading and writing and arithmetic, but there's art class. Where you actually go and you, you you draw and you you make ceramics and so on, right? Why like how has that continued to to exist in in the educational ecosystem? You know, I don't I don't know. Like I said, I you know I'm a roboticist. I, I I spend most of my life in the robotics world, but there are like you know I I see a few of these studies and I'm like I, I know that there's going to be more there. So you know I think they're they're like thinking about how that that generalizes and how that expands out gives us the the way to find the right uh, sources to to target the the um the specific uh you know framing of of the, the thing that we're looking for now i will give one you know because because you brought it up and i think you know i'll, I'll give sort of my I, now this is a far more subjective view of this i, I really like maker spaces in in the sense that they give a, a a place to 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 create and it's a it's a way of getting getting resources together to give a bigger place to create i think that 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 can't stand alone and you know there is plenty of work in in making maker spaces for lower resource communities and you know, I think there, there's like, you know, the Fab Lab is a, is a great one where it's, you know, it goes and, and builds these tools out of cardboard. But one of the things that I've seen, again, not quantitatively, but one of the things that sort of I've, I've experienced uh, sort of in, in anecdotal evidence is that, you know, the more emphasis that gets placed on maker spaces, the more sort of separation creation gets from life. In that, you know, if you have to go somewhere to create, then you're, then, then it, it takes away the idea that you can create just on your own when you're, when you're, you know, when you're brushing your teeth, you're thinking about something, right? Like I do my my some 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 great research in the shower, but if if you know the people who who are, are brought up sort of thinking that I can only do do these think these thoughts when sitting down in in this room that 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 everyone has dedicated this, it may inhibit that a little bit. So I really do want to focus not exclusively on maker spaces. Certainly keep some of that in there, but also think about how do we make it so that making can happen anytime, anywhere, you know, at your home. Like in, in the car, you know, walking through the park, that sort of idea. 
Uh, actually, I, I have another follow up. Actually, if uh, that's okay, um, and maybe going a little bit more specific, in, instead of uh, you know the going really broad, uh, I'm interested in that the actuation that you had with the thread and 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 whatever. Um, it, it, so I haven't seen it before, uh, and I, I'm wondering about the forces that are generated. Uh, clearly, there's some you know stroke. Which is some percentage, but uh, of, of the length. But uh, what type of forces can be generated? Yeah, so um, I think that's a, the, 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 this particular technology. It's it's nylon sewing thread that that's that's coiled. It super coils. So you coil it, and the coils form coils themselves. Um, you know, the the strain that you get is you know, if you very carefully design it, you can get a ten percent strain. If you kind of um, if you if you if you do it based more on on convenience, you can probably get five percent strain pretty easily. Uh, in terms of forces, we're talking about uh, hundreds of millinewtons. I think are pretty pretty easy. Newtons, like in the ones of newtons, you can get uh, with um, with 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 careful design. Now, the nice thing about this is it's eminently stackable. You want twice the force, you just put two strings next to each other, right? And uh, you know you can. So you 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 know I, there, there's a, a colleague that I work with at uh, UNR University of Nevada Reno. They just build bundles of eight of these. And you know, you, you build a thing, and you build it, put eight of them, and you kind of twist them together so it stays as one nice bundle. Um, there, I've seen some other work where you weave it into a fabric, and now you can get like you know, fifteen of them instead of a bundle. They're in a, in a flat sheet, and now you can get you know, you get some some thing there. So force is great. Force you can easily compose. It's the strain that becomes a lot of challenge because it's 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 harder to 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 string them together in parallel. You end up getting a lot of you know, a lot of length, which is which is a little bit more challenging. So that, that's, I think, been the, the biggest constraint on this is that, you know, and that's where this, this bistable beam comes into play, which is that, you know, you can, you, you only need a small deflection around that, uh, around the instability point, which then causes the snap through to get the, the big deflection that can then be translated into some kind of uh, useful, useful work. Yeah, so these are thermal actuators. The, uh, they're, they're conductive. The conductiveness is just to take the electrical energy through resistive heating into thermal energy. And so nylon has these nice thermal, thermoplastic properties where as it heats up, it contracts. Then the coiling is the way of of, uh, of amplifying that contraction into sort of a, a, a reasonable length contraction. Uh, kind of technical question in the chat: um, What about the speed of the actuator? Right. So that's uh, you know the, the the speed is another challenge. Um, the I, I, you know I, I guess some of these uh, I guess the videos that are playing are are playing in real time. The thermal actuators are inherently slow. Um, you know, it takes time to to bring up to to temperature and uh, and and cause that that deflection. So there there's two. Uh, I'll say sort of the, the 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 general rates of 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 oscillation that this thing is driving is on the order of hertz, which means sort of the, the overall bandwidth of these is at the, the you know single or less than single hertz. I think you know we we talk about a period of four seconds, right? And so um, which means like any of the logic that we do, each logical each each sort of gate computation will happen every second or two. Uh, so that's 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 slow. There's um, there's ways of getting around it. Uh, I mean, one of these things again, we we focus on this bistable beam. The 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 four seconds is to get uh, is sort of to to get it through all the way one period. But the snap through itself happens in probably uh, you know I think less than a hundred milliseconds because it's it's this inst the mechanical instability. If we if we did a really like optimize the design right around that instability, we can probably get it faster. Uh, we can we can sort of uh, try to design that. We haven't spent our, much time uh, thinking about that. Um, the other there are other ways of of improving the speed using higher power is is a great way to improve the speed of thermal uh, actuators. Now with higher power, you also need higher thermal dissipation because you get it really hot really quickly. It'll 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 actuate, and um, you know if you do nothing else, you get really fast actuation but really slow opposite actuation because the heat needs to dissipate. So you can use forced air. Um, you can you can blow air through. This water-based uh, uh, system is really nice in that regard because you know right now we have the actuator up on top because you know you, that way it makes it easier to see. But you can flip it upside down, and now the water dissipates the heat very very nicely away from the uh, from the actuator, so you can speed things up in that way. I think fundamentally, you know, speed has not been one of our our criteria on this. I think there's a lot of engineering uh, opportunity in there to to really focus on on the speed of actuation, sort of how that translates throughout the entire pipeline. Question about the water submersion. Um, do you have to worry about like will it 
you have to worry about like safety of putting, you know, like touching the water when it's like on, or would you get shocked from that? Or is that not a concern? Right. So that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. I think uh, safety is one of the things that we, we've spent only a small amount of time thinking about. The nice thing is these are all operating at low voltages. You know, we're, we're putting two volts through, the, through these actuators. Two volts underwater, I mean, you're not really going to see anything. Like, um, it, it, you know, there, certainly there, there's plenty of current, but the current is going along the length of the actuator. The voltage is not, uh, I mean, you know, the, you, there, I, I think in the, uh, in the video, you did see a little bit of electrolysis around the, the terminals. So that, that may be a little bit more of a concern where if you were to do this like over an extended period of time and you had it inside a closed bucket and all of a sudden you have a, this like nice mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, that may be a little bit uh, dicey. Although maybe, hey, that gives you another opportunity for a different form of education in terms of, you know, stoichiometry and, and all the other, uh, you know, other stuff. Explosions are also fun, just like uh, robots. So, yeah. No, but yeah, you're right. I think there, there are some safety concerns around that. And, you know, there, the, I, don't think elect, elect, uh, I don't think electrocution is, is necessarily one of the ones that we care more about. So, as in, I don't think it's as, as relevant to this. But there will be others. And I think, you know, as we, as we start thinking about putting this in, in unstructured environment, unsupervised environments, there'll be some, some questions there. Probably the biggest safety concern across all of this has been paper cuts so far. Like, you know, there, there has been plenty of blood sacrifice to the robot gods through, from that avenue, so. Uh, the oscillator also is kind of really cool. Um, and the water uh, swimming, I think, you know, works, uh, but wouldn't work if you had just Stokes flow, something really small. Um, and the scratch drive is kind of interesting. Uh, so those are two mechanisms where, you know, when you have something that's oscillating, you have a way of differentiating the motion from one way or the other inertia or the, the scratch drive. Are there other mechanisms that you know that can, you know, in which we can get locomotion from something that's oscillating? That's a, uh, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I'll say that, you know, there, there's a lot of, a lot of engineering considerations that need to go into that, but it's not everything. Like a lot of that's really old, like steam engines use a single oscillation, oscillating motion to generate, you know, uh, generate power uh, on the locomotive. And they do that using, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, fundamentally it is an inertial effect, right? You have the wheel and that wheel drives it past that, that, the, the equilibrium point. Fun, I think everything will need to have is some, some nature of, of that. I think the, uh, I guess asymmetrical friction doesn't rely on inertia, but yeah. So um, I, th I, think, I think inertia is, is a great way to do it just because that's, there's a lot of linkages that ex explore that in the past. There is one thing that, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll throw out there as a thing that we are investigating, which, um, which we don't have a lot of, uh, like this, this is just a, a sort of a future thing that we'll, we'll think about. We don't have a lot of, of, of concrete engineering done on that yet, but you can, you can change the, the bistable beam itself uh, so it's not symmetric. And so you can pot potentially get different, uh, you know, different behaviors on one direction of the snap through versus the other. And that may be then, you, know, you can then translate that through a linkage to say, you know, if, it, if it snaps through slower in one direction than the other, then, then you can have some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of linkage that, that has a time dependency that, that'll give you some, some, some asymmetry there. Um, or, or, you know, you could, you could have something be with like, perhaps through a, a nonlinear, uh, spring that says, you know, as it, as it snaps through it, you know, triggers the first, you know, behavior versus the second behavior, which are, which are asymmetric in that regard. The easier, uh, solution is to just use two of these to use two oscillators that are out of phase from each other. And now you have a four, four, uh, four, uh, four phase sequencer, and then you, you can, you know, build gates into this thing. And then that gives you the ability to say, you know, well, it's moving this way and it's moving this way and you combine them and now you're moving this way. Um, are there any other questions in the audience or online using the Q&A button? Okay, well, we're at about time. Uh, so uh, let's give uh, uh, Ankur a hand again. That's a wonderful talk.